so I, uh, this, this past week, um, I was reading a book and this verse came up and I thought, man, that is a wild verse. It's just, I, I don't think I've ever read it before. Or maybe I have and it's back in the, the memory bank somewhere. But I read it and I immediately had to, to share it with my friend. Uh, I don't know if you guys are on Skype, but uh, I Skype with my friend in Texas about three times a week. We talk about theology and just uh, just all kinds of stuff. But I was like, I've got I've to share this with him because it's, it's one of those verses that just kind of, you're reading along and all of a sudden it just kind of sucker punches you. And you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? Um, so I wanted to, to share it with you guys this morning, but it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verses 24 through 25. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Um, let me read the verse to you and then I'll share what my friend sent back after he read it. Verse 24 says, But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the, secret of his, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Man, he's talking to the church. This is Paul talking to the church. He's giving this, this discourse on tongues and prophesy, prophecy, and he's kind of saying, you know, if, if you all are speaking in tongues, you know, everyone would be impressed, but everyone would also think that you're crazy. Uh, you know, but if you're all prophesying, if you're all sharing what's going on, you know, what God's done, what God is doing, who God is, that this is what happens, that this, this crazy idea that this person, this unbeliever, is walking by the church, is walking by the assembly of the believers, and he sees what's going on in there, and it causes him to go, whoa. You know, and I like the imagery that Paul uses, because it's not like he just comes in, he's like, yay, all right, I believe in God too. You know, it says he falls on his face, you know, that, that he's overcome by what's going on, that it doesn't, it doesn't make sense with what else is going on in the world, that he comes in and, and he's just, he's almost dumbfounded. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where it literally causes you to just fall on your face. It's very few. I'm not a real emotional person anyways, but, <coughs> excuse me, there's very few times where I could think that like being overcome and I just fall on my face. Uh, you know, it just, it's not a, a real common occurrence. Uh, maybe it is for you and I don't, I'll be around to catch you or something. You know, like, oh, they have the kind of pizza I like, oh, and just fall down and, uh, you know, that, that's not me. I like pizza, but not that much. Um, but the person, the unbeliever, walks by, and he sees this, this assembly gathering, and they're all discussing what's going on. They're all, if you look up the word prophecy and, and what it's talking about, it's not talking about telling the future, okay? It's talking about speaking about who God is, uh, sharing what he's done. It's talking about taking care of one another and, and doing these, these things where it's, it's, like Christ, basically. It's being like Christ um, in this specific uh, verse. And uh, so the person comes by and they see that and it, it just overcomes them. And they not only now, they fall on their face and they begin to, to worship, you know, basically, but they also look at the crowd, the gathering, and say that, that truly God is among you. And I sent this to my friend and you know, it just kind of, it was catching me off guard when I read it. And the first thing, he sent back a message about two seconds later that just said, wow, wouldn't it be crazy to be in, in that kind of place? You know, in that, you know, to be in church and you're all sitting together and this guy just walks in and falls down on his face down here and, and goes, you know, surely God is among you. You know, I, I'm a believer too. I, I now understand this. You know, that would just blow me away. And I got to thinking for a second, this isn't Paul saying like, this is this weird thing that could happen. This is Paul saying like, this is, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, this is what happens. You know, if you're all prophesying, if you're all sharing what's going on among you, then this would be the natural response. That someone would be overcome and come and just go bananas basically and say, you know, I see what you are and I see that there's something different and I'm overcome by that. Um, you know, I, I just can't imagine 
that happening. I, I, that would be one of the most awesome things to be a, a part of. So uh, Paul is basically just showing us a picture of, of what can happen if the church is, is functioning properly as the church. Uh, I'm going to share some verses later that will kind of speak to that. But if you notice when Paul is talking, if you read the whole chapter, um, he's not really talking about something that's this far out wild thing. And he's not talking about it like if and this could and, you know, far off in the future and if everyone was this. You know, this is just a normal gathering of people. You know, people that believe in what Christ did. People who understand who God really is. And uh, that this is nothing super special going on. It's just, it's just the people of God being the people of God. You know, and talking about who God is. It's an, ama- it's an incredibly challenging thing because uh, it immediately, <laughs> it starts to hit you if you kind of, I'm, I'm a person who, I can't just look at something on the surface. I have to, to bear out the entire thing all the way down to as far as it can go and the most simple, you know, just understanding of it. You know, I, I have to get it all the way down to that. Uh, I always tell Natalie, like, the gut level of stuff. I, she makes fun of me about that because it sounds gross. But, um, you yeah, know, that's, that's the way I think. I, I can't help it. It's just that's how it thinks. So as soon as I read a verse like this, I think of the implication that it means for my life, that it means for me, that it means for the church. Uh, and when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about crossroads specifically. Uh, you know, it's the church, the body of Christ. The, uh, I use a big word, the ecclesia. I like that word. Um, you know, the, that's what it's speaking of, the entire, you know, assembly of the believers. <coughs> so, Paul is just showing that this is, is, is what happens if the people of God behave like the people of God. If the people of God behave like they really believe that, that there's this God that is up there right now, and, you know, he's there's there's Christ that died for you that that all of these things happen that's it changes things it, it causes a whole different reaction in our lives it changes the way that we act in every situation so there's all these implications that you start looking at in your life and in the way that you act and all that so Paul is just uh he's making the point that this is the way that the the church should look it's He's making this, this idea that, that the lost, uh, an unbeliever, should be able to look into the church and see something different. Uh, should be able to look, you know, walk by and, and look into here or, or see the church gathering or just see your life as the church out in the world and see something different. Um, I would challenge you. I, I just would encourage you it's, I would encourage you to do something that's not encouraging, uh, but to go on compu- the computer uh, and just type in the name of a city and then pastor. Almost any city. Uh, just, uh, I'll tell you, type in Jacksonville and then youth pastor, or type in Tampa youth pastor, or Tampa pastor, whatever, and the first five results are not going to be nice. They're not going to be like, this pastor is awesome and he's, you know, caring for people or this church or whatever. You know, it's almost, it's just negative. It's not good stuff. You know, the question that I have for you uh, is, is the church doing what we're supposed to be doing? You know, and it's not just that there's this few little people over here that are, are messing up or whatever and giving the whole thing a bad name. It's, is the church we as a whole, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Are we living like we're supposed to be living? Um, it takes me to the second verse that I want to use, or the group of verses that I want to use today. Uh, it's very familiar. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And I hope, don't let the familiarity of this verse uh, kind of block you from the awesome teaching that's there because it, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that, that, that Christ is telling us. This is Jesus talking 
And he says, he's talking to the believers, to the followers. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light unto all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Those two, ver- those two texts, I, they just go together. I, it, just, it makes sense. You've got this picture of the unbeliever looking into the church gathering and seeing them doing this different thing, and it, it causes a reaction. It causes them to come and give glory to God and accept what Christ has done. And then you have Jesus basically telling the believers that this is who we're supposed to be. You're supposed to be salt. You're supposed to be light. That that's who we're supposed to be in this world. Um, I, like, I like the way that this is just, if salt loses its saltiness, that's kind of a, a funny thing. You, could salt really lose its saltiness? I'm sorry, I'm used to teenagers. Uh, you're allowed to... <laughs> Can salt, if salt loses its saltiness, what would it be called? Unsalt, not salt. <laughs> it would just be called alt or something. <laughs> Slaz. Um, you know, it would be salt backwards. It, it wouldn't make sense. You know, if you got the, the little shaker out of the cupboard and you went over and you're putting it on your pizza uh, or your baked potato or <laughs> whatever food item that you like, um, and you sprinkled it on there and you took a bite and you're like, there's no saltiness to this. And you sprinkle more on there and, you, and it's like crunching in your teeth, but you can't taste it at all. You're like, that's not salt. That's, you know, nothing. It's, it's the way that Jesus describes this is so, it's just it like immediately just kind of puts it on you. I don't know how else to say it. Because uh, he's saying basically salt, if it loses its savor, it's good for nothing. Same way with you. You know, if you're a Christian, if you're not like Christ, then you're not really, it's not making any sense. It doesn't work. You know, if the world walks by and sees the church and the Christians, and they're not acting like the church and Christians, if they're not acting like Christ, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, it's the same idea with the light. You know, I, when we're at home, I, I don't really care. I turn off the lights because I like to see the TV and the TV's brighter in the dark so it looks better to me. Natalie likes to have lights on everywhere so that she can see everything. I don't really care. Um, but, you know, it, it wouldn't make sense if you're sitting in a dark house and uh, you hear a noise in another room and you get your flashlight out, are you going to take your flashlight and turn it on and then put your hand over it? It doesn't make any sense. You know, it doesn't work. He's saying, it doesn't work to take this candlestick or this torch or whatever and to light it up so that you can see and then put a bushel on top of it or put a basket on top of it. It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't work. Because uh, you're now, you're taking this thing that you've, you're needing to see and you're making it not work. You're making it ineffective. Um, so Jesus is giving a, an example this idea of what the follower, his followers are supposed to be like. Um, you know, I, I think I, I struggled with putting this together because it's, it's tough to really to put these ideas together and to get them to come out right. Um, but I think a lot of times we, we have this idea that the goal of, of the Christian, the goal of, of Christianity uh, is to just make it through life. You, know, you just get through and you sin less and that's, that's the goal. You know? uh, it's not how it works. We're not here just to make it through. We're not here just to, to sin less. If that was it, it would be, you know, not really that big of a deal. You know, here's this group of the, the church and they, 
they're just kind of plugging along. They're going to get to the end, and uh, they don't sin as much as they used to, and they, they try to do better. It doesn't work. And when you look at Christ, if we're supposed to be like Christ, you know, his life didn't look like that. It wasn't like he was just kind of making it through life and trying to show us how to, how to be good people. Yeah, there's a lot of good people that aren't Christians. There's a lot of good people that are making it through this life that don't know who Christ is. have nothing to do with him. So if we're just, that's it, just supposed to be good people, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I think that sometimes our, our goal gets a little bit skewed. We get off on that. And we think all of a sudden that our that that's that's the main goal is just making it through and, and sinning less. <coughs> you know, our our job as followers, Jesus makes it very clear here. He's he's saying exactly like here is your job. You know, your job is for others to see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's that's our job is to make the Father known. That's that's what we're here to do. Is not just to kind of muddle through life and okay, I don't do that thing that I used to do and I'm a better person now. Our job is that we live this life that people look into it and it, it's, it's confounding. It just blows people's mind because they're like, how in the world? There's no way that you can live that way if there's not something different. If there's not a, a different kind of something inside of you. And that it, it makes them react, where they have to actually look at you and they say, there's something different. I don't understand what it is. You know, it must be God. It must be what they're talking about. That idea of prophesying, it, you're sharing. You have to be talking about it. Uh, it would be weird if I was always talking about how great God was and how great Christ was and, you know, what he's, a difference he's made in my life and how different I should be or I am and all this and then if my life looks exactly like everybody else's it doesn't work you know is anyone going to look at you if you're just like them and be like ooh I want that no it, whenever you look at I, I'm like a a wannabe I like to ride my bike and I like to to do uh, I like to go surfing and skateboarding and uh, when you when you grow up and you skateboard and you surf, the the thing that you have to do you're you just you you can't get out of it. You have to buy surfing magazines. It's just it's required. Um, my mom didn't understand that, but it <laughs> you have to. And the whole reason that you do that is so that you can flip through the pages and see what these people are doing and how in just incredibly talented they are, and uh, you can try to emulate that. And that, that's kind of what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be like this magazine or this, this kind of like a, just a taste of what Christ is like so that people look at it and they're like, I want to be like that. I want to do that. I want to have that same thing. <laughs> um, so our, our goal, our job, our, our main thing is not just to make it through, but our, our goal and everything is to, is to make Christ known, is to make the Father known. That's it. I, I think sometimes we get into all these ideas of, you know, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to do this, and you've got to look like this, and not look like that, and you can't go here, but you can go there. And so it's like Christianity can become this, this list of rules and we can almost be defined as Christians by what we don't do. I'm a Christian, so I don't do that. I'm a Christian, so I don't do that. I'm a Christian, so I don't do that. And that's not who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be defined by what we do. Is there any group, any club, any organization that's defined by what they don't do? I tried to think of it. I'm sure I could pull something out of somewhere. But there's not many. Yeah, the, like a soccer club. They're not defined by what they don't do. They, they're not called a soccer club because they don't do slip and slides or they don't play you know, regular football or whatever. They're called a soccer club because they play soccer or, or you know, football, however you want to say it. You know, that's, that's why they're called a soccer team or club. Um, it doesn't make sense for us as Christians to be called Christians because we don't do 
And we don't smoke or chew or run with girls that do. Um, <laughs> uh, I grew up independent Baptist. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that's, not, that's not who we're supposed to be. Jesus says that we're supposed to be defined by what we do. By people look into our life and they say, oh, man, there's something different. They're doing good works. You know, I think uh, we've gotten scared of that, that idea in general. Anytime you hear the word work in church, you're like, wait a second. We're not legalists here. We've got grace. Grace is awesome. But you've, you've not just been saved to sit back. I, I, I was under a pastor for years who his entire message was, you're saved to rest. That's all you do. You rest, you sit back, and you just live your life, and you go through it, and, and every, all this stuff just happens. That all of a sudden you're digging wells in Africa, you know, it just because you're resting. And while I understand the, the theology behind it, uh, practically it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. Uh, if I want to be the best football player or the best uh, uh, surfer or the best, you know, badminton player, ping pong, I don't know, whatever. You can't just sit back and be like, oh, I'm thinking about it, and it's awesome. It's inundating my aura, and now I'm all of a sudden going to get up and, you know, be able to do it. It doesn't work. You, know, you have to put that into practice. There has to be something that you're doing. And notice that this isn't talking about salvation. Uh, nothing of our, our salvation doesn't come from any type of work. You know, salvation comes through Christ and his sacrifice and atoning death alone. By grace, through faith, that's it. This is just Christ talking about this is how once you've accepted that, this is how you live. Uh, it, there's been a lot of confusion with that in the, the past years. And I want to be very clear that, that salvation is, is through faith. That's it. It's just by gr the grace of God and what he's done for us. The works are supposed to be, okay, here's, here you're in the life of Christ, now these things flow out of your life. This is what it looks like. This is what Christ looked like. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, we accomplish this whole thing of, of, uh, of people seeing in our lives and glorifying our Father in heaven, seeing our, our good works and glorifying our Father in heaven uh, by our good works, by our, what we're doing in this life, by the way that we act, by the way that we react. Um, I am a road rager. <laughs> I try really, really hard not to be. Uh, my horn is automatic. <laughs> As soon as someone, like I, Natalie calls me the road police, I'm watching everybody. And as soon as someone, like, sort of like, meh, meh, I saw you, uh, you know, I can't help it. And we drive back and forth to Jacksonville a lot. So I'm always on 75, and people drive crazy on 75. And, uh, man, I, it takes everything within me to just relax and drive, just go the speed limit and ignore everyone else and just cruise. That, Oh, it's really hard for me. Um, but, you know, the uh, last week, last week or the week before, I don't remember. Uh, they all blur together. Uh, once you have a baby and they're under, like, two, every day is the same day. <laughs> it's just change diaper, walk around. <laughs> You're like, okay, cool. Um, what month is it? Uh, so the other day, that could be any time, uh, we were going to a family Christian bookstore, and I just told my teenagers this this past week. But we were going, and uh, this guy like swerved and cut me off, and it like I go from do to do to do to ah, it's crazy. Like want to get out of the car, jump off of it, land on his car, punch through his windshield, and you know, it just it does something to me. I don't know why, especially when I have the baby in the car. It's like I hate everyone. Um, but you know, it's. It's those things I, I started thinking as soon as, because I like laid on my horn and then I, you know, I backed off and it's just like, whew, okay, okay, okay. But I was thinking, you know, what if this guy's going over there to, to Jimmy John's or Five Guys or, you know, whatever's right around that, that family Christian bookstore? You know, what is his reaction going to be? It's not going to be, oh, I did something stupid and I got honked at. 
It's going to be, oh, there's another one of those Christians that's just like all the rest of them. He's just a jerk. You know, he's just crabby and mean and, you know, whatever. Uh, he's not going to see the, the life of Christ in me. He's not going to see grace at all. You know, it's, I know that seems like a, an overly simple idea, but, I mean, it's, it's the overly simple things of our days that define our days, and it's our days that define our, our lives. You know, it's not just this big overarching thing that all of a sudden your life is defined by Christ. It's your, your hours and your minutes and your weeks and your days. That's what defines who you are. Uh, so that, that idea just kind of, all of a sudden I'm like, man, blew it again. Uh, and I start, I start thinking, I told you, I, I think about the implications. That's, that's the way I, I think is, okay, here's this idea. Christ has said, you're supposed to be salt and light. You know, the way that people see me is by seeing you and they glorify the Father because of, of your good works and the way that you act, that you're, you're actually salt and you're light in this world. And that, you know, when people, an unbeliever sees the way that you live your life, you know, that it causes the, this reaction that they all of a sudden, it's like, oh, there's something different. There's something beyond who I am uh, that I, I need to know more. So I start thinking, I, I thought, you know, uh, I just wanted to, to kind of issue you guys a challenge, I, I guess. Um, just kind of throw down the gauntlet, <laughs> you know, uh, so that you guys can understand the way that I think, you know, and so that we can kind of do this together, I think, is the, the idea that I'm trying to get. So in light of these scriptures, I, I just want to kind of challenge you. Uh, are you... I'm not talking to Crossroads Baptist Church. I'm talking to you, and you, and you, and you, and you know, you, whoever you are. Are you taking your job seriously? Are you taking what you're supposed to be, that idea of being salt and light, are you taking that seriously? Are you taking the idea that the very the thing that you're called in this world, which is Christian, are you taking that name seriously? Are you, are you thinking in every situation, every aspect of your life, which gets tough, am I being like Christ in this? Am I, am I acting in a way that, that represents him well? Am I acting in a way that is salt and light in this world? So I started thinking of these, these implications. Uh, and the first thing that just kind of obviously popped into my brain, is there anyone, anyone, anybody at all in your life right now that you are actively, intentionally, purposefully pursuing for Christ? Is there anybody that you're after right now? Is there anyone that you're discipling? Is there anyone that you're trying to win to the Lord? That you're in their life every day, that you're showing them who Christ is and we have no excuses in that. It doesn't matter if you're 10, 12, you know, whatever, or you're 112. There, there's no excuses. If you're 112, you've got a lot more experience. <laughs> you know, there you go. Uh, you know, we all have the opportunity. We all have the Holy Spirit that lives within us. We all have the, the opportunity and the means to be actively engaged in drawing people to Christ and showing who he is. So that, that's, that's the challenge number one. Is there anyone in your life that you're not just like casually going to work and be like, I'm going to be a good guy at work today so people can see how awesome he is. Is there anyone that you're, I'm going to go to work and talk to Robert, you know, or Jim or <laughs> Sally, I don't know. Uh, you know, just some person. Is there someone that you're actively engaged in pursuing? It's not just that you're trying to, you know, Oh, I let them cut in front of me at the bathroom line or I, uh, you know, let them get in front of me in the, the car or whatever, that you're engaged in pursuing, that you're after. Um, okay, so that's that, that enough for me when I thought of that implication. I'm like, man, <laughs> that's hard. Because <laughs> all of a sudden it's like, oh, all of my life, like every aspect of it is supposed to be Christ. Not just when I'm at church, not just, you know, whatever, not whatever. It's, every aspect so 
So then I started going through the aspects of my life. Uh, so I would like to ask you, is, is where you live, your house, uh, your neighborhood, your, the part of the world that you live in, uh, is your job, is the, the way that you spend your money, is the car that you drive, the friendships that you have or don't have, uh, every aspect of your life, is it the best way that you can be using those portions or aspects of your life to reach people for Christ, to make God known? Christ didn't die so that we could just sin less. Christ didn't die so you could muddle through life and, and get to the end and be like, oh boy, you know. Christ died so that you could be set free to live like him and to show the rest of this world what he's like. So all of a sudden, I say all of a sudden, all the time, because uh, it's, it's like, you know, it just appears out of nowhere that now, okay, every aspect, it no longer is any of this life mine. You ever thought about that? That none of this stuff that you have, none of the places that you want to go, none of that is yours. None of it matters. That's, that's a hard thing to think about because it immediately puts me in, I like stuff. <laughs> I like my car. Well, I kind of like my car. I want a better car. Um, you know, it, it, that's that whole thing right there. Is the car that you drive right now, is that the best way that you can spend God's money or use your car or whatever to, to glorify God? Is the house that you live in right now the best way that you can spend your money and, and are you using your house to, to invite people into? Are you using your house to, to show people that there's a difference in your life? Are you using your money? Money, oof, don't talk about that. That's a tough one. Is the way that you spend your money, who are you spending your money on? I could say most of the time I'm spending my money on me because I, I work a job, I have to pay bills, so I'm spending my money on me. And it's like, whoa, okay, now I'm seeing that there's this whole thing where this isn't my money to begin with. None of this stuff is mine anyways. It's his. Are you stewarding it well? And I don't mean are you saving it up so you can retire one day and not have to work. I mean, are you saving it up so that you can send it to other people to, to you know, dig a well in Africa or so that some little child that isn't eating today can eat? Are you busy? Do you have time to, to invite someone into your home and share the gospel with them? Do you have time to, to cook a meal for somebody during the week? Do you have time? There are children, thousands and thousands of children right now that have no parents, that have nobody that cares about them. And uh, this is something that gets me, uh, it bugs me. Um, but there are kids all over this place that, that need what you have that need security and that need stability and a lot of us have the opportunity to do that we have the ability we have you know, the means and the transportation whatever and I'm not saying go adopt a kid tomorrow I'm saying you know, go be in somebody's life you know, uh, go volunteer someplace you know, do a WANAS work in that do a VBS, you know, but don't make it where it's my one day a week I do this thing. It's, it's every aspect of your life now revolves around this life of Christ and that shows forth and shines and people look at it and say, there's something different. Why in the world you're retired? You're, you're 70 years old. You're whatever. Why are you going and hanging out with little kids? You don't have the patience for that. You don't have the way to, to go and just sit around with that. You know, you, you're, you're 20 years old. Why are you going out and doing that? Why are you spending your money in that area? Why are you doing that? That doesn't make sense. And so it ultimately comes down to this. And I like this, I like this idea. Uh, don't say so myself. Does your life, does it make sense to this world? Okay, now I'll think about that for a second. 
does your life, the way that you spend your money, the car you drive, the, the car that you aspire to drive, the, the house that you have, the house that you want, whatever, does it make sense to this world? Because what what's this world all about? America, what's this America all about? It's, it's all about the American dream, right? You know, we, we need to, to have a house. And we need to, to have stuff and to be able to do and, you know, have this luxurious lifestyle. And that makes sense to the people around us. So we start looking and we're like, well, does, our, does my life make sense in light of that in light of the rest of this world and I, I kind of am chugging along right there with them and you know but I have I have Jesus over here too I go to church and I don't do this stuff I don't smoke you know I used to I don't do that anymore I, I don't I don't go out and drink and party and I don't you know curse unless I'm drunk uh, there's <laughs> there's this stupid old joke and the the pastor gives the invitation this guy's bawling and he runs down to the the front, and he's down there, and the pastor goes, and he says, oh, you know, what, what can I pray with you? You know, what's going on? He says, pastor, I still cuss when I get drunk. And uh, pastor is like, <laughs> we can solve both of those. Uh, you know, it's, it's not that I don't do those things anymore. You know, it's that my life, is it, is it just defined by those things, or does my life make sense in the light that, that Christ died for me, that God an omnip- omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, just all-knowing being that lives in unapproachable light is there, that's being worshipped right now. Does my life make sense in light of that? Do I, what do I really believe? You know, because if you really believe something, it makes a difference in your life. And not just in the, the little parts. Because the little parts, you know, it makes a difference in the whole thing. Um, so that, that's kind of what I wanted to, to just throw down the gauntlet about. And uh, you know, we're here as a church. The reason that we meet together is not just so that we can come together and, and sing and give our money and, uh, you know, see our friends. The reason that we come to church, the reason that the church meets together is so that we can spur one another on to good works. So that we come together and I see you and you see me and we talk about things that are going on and we encourage one another to go out into this world and to do something. That's why we're here together. I hope that's why you came today. Because that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here to do. Uh, I know I don't always do that right, but uh, you know, that's what I want to be about. You know, so that's that's the kind of the goal that I want to give to you guys, and uh, to encourage one another to work together to make a difference, to be salt and light in this world, so that when people walk by and they see your life, you know, they see you as as a part of the church they see that there's something different. They see that you're somebody different. Because that's our goal, is to make the Father known. Let's pray.